go. There we go. So Ross McClure is coming to us to talk about uh, actually observing these theoretical things called Maybe. first Thank galaxies. <laughs> So I've been asked to review uh, observations of the first galaxies over the last two or three years. Um, that's quite a big ask. I don't know how many hundreds of papers have been on observations of uh, high redshift galaxies over the last two or three years, but it's many hundreds. So I've basically boiled it down to two or three things uh, that I think are of interest, and I'll talk about those. So I'll start off by talking about the basic demographics, what we've learned about the, the luminosity functions, the mass functions, and mass assembly, etc. Try not to keep the overlap with the previous talk to a minimum. And then talk about uh, what we know about star formation, density, at high redshift. The first two of these, of course, give us the, basically the photon budget for reionization. I'll talk very briefly about recent attempts to try and measure what the live and continuum escape fraction is. So the results of that are all over the place at the moment, I think. And then some things about nebular emission at high redshift and how people are now using that to, to uh, confirm with near infrared spectrographs, uh, galaxies out to redshift of about eight and a half albeit with low signal-to-noise. And at the end, I'll spend a few minutes talking about this mysterious object, CR7, that we heard from Volker previously to lunch. And this has been an object where people have claimed the signature of POT3 star formation. I think I'll show some, some new observational data that places that in some doubt. And at the end, I'll talk very briefly about ALMA and what we know about dust at high redshift. So the demographics first. So basically, I would say our knowledge of, of the luminosity functions, mass functions, et cetera, has been completely transformed over the last five years. And it's been transformed thanks to the availability of a huge amount of public HST data, fundamentally. So there's the deepest near-infrared image of the, of the universe ever taken in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, an Ultra UDF-12 campaign which I was involved in. And then there's been the very famous Candle survey, which is shallower data but covers a much larger area and also uh, data looking at lensing clusters, first clash, and then the latest, which I'll talk about in a minute, the HST Frontier Field Survey. So thanks to this publicly available data, we can now assemble samples of about 10,000 or more high redshift galaxies at redshift 4 to uh, 8, certainly, which is something that we just couldn't do five years ago. And at the same time, there's been a lot of work put into getting very deep near-infrared imaging from the ground over a much larger field, so a couple of square degrees. And that's work that I've been heavily involved with as a student at Edinburgh. And that allows us to actually study bright or massive galaxies at high redshift for the first time in, uh, in reasonable numbers. Because of this wealth of data, we can now study the basic luminosity function of these galaxies in reasonable detail right out to the epoch of ionization. So this is a, uh, an image I've taken from Rebecca's latest paper this year, looking at the current state of play on the redshift 7 luminosity function of galaxies. And because we can combine the ground-based data at the bright end with this incredibly deep HST data from all these different fields, then we can study it over a full area of about two square degrees, and crucially, over a dynamic range of about 1,000 in UV luminosity. So that's at least a factor of 10 more than we could do only five years ago or so. I've stolen this figure from a nice review that Steve Finkelstein wrote this year, where he's tried to put together all the different studies in the last five years of the luminosity function and try to put some sort of consensus view of how the luminosity function evolves from redshift 4 out to a redshift of 10, although you can see at redshift 10 we're really struggling for any data at all. And it, moves, it evolves very smoothly, basically. This is, this is this kind of fiducial or consensus fit to how the luminosity function evolves as a function of redshift here. And basically, uh, the normalization drops by about a factor of 10. The characteristic luminosity doesn't change very much, maybe about a magnitude over this full, full redshift range. Crucially for reionization, the, the slope of the luminosity function is very steep, and it just continues to get steeper as we get to higher redshift. So by the time we get into the uh, epoch of reionization at redshift 7 and 8, uh, the data would suggest that the slope is as steep as minus 2. So that was a compilation of what people have been doing over the last five years. What are people doing right at this moment? Well, a lot of work has been done on the latest public HST data set, which is called the Hubble Frontier Field. And this is where they're looking at six cluster and parallel pairs. I think five of them are now completed. And they're throwing a lot of integration time, 140 hours integration per pair, in seven filters covering the optical and near-infrared. So this is a gold mine for studying high redshift of galaxies, at least photometrically. And of course, the key thing here is by studying uh, massive low redshift clusters, we have strong gravitational lensing. And in principle, that allows you to study galaxies that are intrinsically fainter than you could even access through the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And that's what people have been working hard to try and do. 
I should just uh, add a note of caution into this. When you're looking at results coming from the Hubble Frontier fields, um, there's lots of different groups have produced the lensing maps of these fields. Um, and here's one example of the first Hubble Frontier field cluster that was taken, showing the regions of high magnification, the caustics, if you like. But a key point is that the different groups that produce these models actually produce lensing maps that don't agree perfectly well. I think that would be the fair conclusion. In the low lensing regime, the maps, they agree pretty well. But in the high, in the center of these clusters, where the magnifications are very large, then they can differ by factors of 2 to 10 in the magnifications they predict for an individual object, which obviously makes things pretty tricky. Um, this is a, a plot we saw in the last talk. Despite the difficulties of using the lens and maps, people have been putting a huge amount of work into try and study the faint end of the luminosity function using these Frontier Fields data sets. This is one of the first uh, papers to come out showing these results from Rachel Livermore that came out two or three months ago. And this is her uh, estimate of the luminosity function at redshift six and seven. Okay, and it's pushing it, her data is in pink here, and it's pushing it back all the way to absolute magnitudes of nearly minus 12. Okay, so this is the the shaded region I've shown here is the new regime that's been opened up by the frontier fields, deeper than what we could have done previously with the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. The key results are that there appears to be no sign of a turnover. A lot of galaxy evolution models would predict that the luminosity function would have turned over by this point. Can't see it so far. Um, and the faint end slope is still very steep at about minus two, which is good news for reionization. The thing to bear in mind is that to access these data, you've had to go to magnifications in the range of 10 to 50. Okay, and there's a lot of uncertainty involved in the different maps in that regime. However, this is one of the first papers. I suspect there'll be many more in the, in the months and years ahead. As well as luminosity functions, people try to measure the mass function of galaxies to allow them to do a more direct comparison with theoretical models. There's been huge amounts of work on this over the last five or six years, and all of it is thanks to combining deep HST in the infrared imaging with the capabilities in the mid-infrared of the Spitzer Space Telescope which is remarkable given the size of Spitzer that it can actually have this contribution to this field. And most of it's come over the deep candles fields. Now, I've taken this figure from the latest study by Mimi Song that was out two or three months ago, but there's been huge amounts of work by various different people doing basically the same thing with these data sets. This is the classic technique of making your data points very big and making everybody else's data points very small which allows you to say that everything looks under perfect control. And indeed, these, these mass functions look very plausible compared to what we have in the luminosity functions. And I think it's fair to say that at the high mass end, things are under reasonable control. But if you look at the data points at the faint end or the low mass end, then there's wide variations in what people get. And that's basically because at these low mass limits, this is uh, objects which aren't individually detected with spits, and we don't have much control over what the mass of these objects might be. JWST, JWST will have a huge impact here, of course. However, I said that things look plausible, and indeed they do. People uh, plot the mass assembly as a function of redshift. Now, ideally, the assembled mass at any redshift should be the integral of the previous star formation. So if we think we know what the star formation history of the universe is, then we should be able to, we should be able to predict what the assembled mass is, which is what's shown here as the dotted line, and then compare it with the actual measurements at every different redshift. And the first order of these things agree reasonably well. There's nothing particularly worrying going on here, but the agreement's at the factor of two level, I would say. So there's still a lot of work to be done. And in rough numbers, it looks like by the time we get to about redshift 4, about 10% of the local mass density has been formed, with the majority of it coming in at later redshifts. So connected to the luminosity functions, the mass functions, is the, is the uh, thorny topic of what the star formation density or what the UV density of the universe is at high redshift. And this is something that's been debated a lot within the galaxy evolution community and has caused a bit of controversy, which is always good. So that's why I'm going to talk about it briefly. When the deep data or the deepest data came out for the Hubble Ultra Deep Field back in 2013, Richard Ellis, myself, and others estimated what, the, what was happening to the star formation density of the universe as we got out past the redshift of eight. Out to redshift of eight, everybody pretty much agrees what the star formation density of the universe is because everybody pretty much agrees what the luminosity function is. Now, there was huge error bars here, as you can see, but we claimed that basically the star formation rate density was falling off, continued to fall off gently at redshift greater than eight, which is what most of the theoretical models predicted as well. A year or so after that, Pascal Ocean and his collaborators looked uh, in basically in the two goods fields for very high redshift candidates and didn't find very many, and therefore concluded that actually the star formation rate density of the universe was dropping off like a stone past redshift eight. Okay? with a very steep parallel dependence as 1 plus z to the nearly minus 11 here. 
Okay, so we claim smooth, they claim dramatic. So is that interesting? Um, I think it probably is, because if this is true, then we're seeing an incredibly dramatic buildup in the galaxy population over a very compressed time scale, something like 150 or 200 mega years, okay? which would be a surprise, I think. Also, if this was true, we'd be really struggling to provide the photons for reionization from galaxies, I think. And it would be very bad news for JWST, because there wouldn't be very many redshift greater than 10 galaxies for it to look at, and that was one of the driving scientific motives for the telescope. So this is something that I've had a student in Edinburgh working on over the last couple of years, and has been published uh, in a couple of McLeod et al. papers uh, this year and last. And what Derek did was he took all the deep data that he could possibly find that was suitable for hunting Redshift 9 galaxies, because Redshift 9 is where all the argument actually is, really, and where we can actually do something about solving it. Um, it's a total area of about 130 square minutes, which is not large in ground-based survey terms, but it is pretty large for, for HST surveys. And he used the, the multi-wavelength data to select Redshift 9 candidates um, from photometric Redshift fitting. And he came up with a sample of 30 galaxies. So we're not exactly talking huge statistics here, but even that was a large improvement on what had been done previously. And what we find is that actually the fall off in the star formation rate density is, is pretty smooth, as we, as we suspected previously, but were unable to, to demonstrate. So this red line here and the black data points are our latest estimate. And you can see that going through Redshift 8, 9, and even 10 with a large error bar, things hold up pretty well. Um, there's nothing particularly dramatic happening here, which is in reasonable agreement with the majority of theoretical expectations. So here's our data uh, over a bunch of, of the latest models in the literature. Most of them fall off in a very comparable way to what the data shows. One or two exceptions don't. This is the illustrious model here, which may be struggling for uh, resolution uh, for this type of object. Um, but most of the models actually are in reasonable agreement with what we find in the data. So this is good news. JWST will have plenty of galaxies to look at, and we probably will be able to do reionization with the galaxies alone. Um, so I won't talk about this very much, but from an observer's perspective, when we say, can we explain reionization with the galaxy population, what we actually mean is, can we explain the optical depth that either WMAP or Planck comes up with based on our knowledge of the star formation history of the universe? And when WMAP was up here for Tau, then it was a real struggle. We could hardly do it. You could just about do it, and that's what the orange curve shows here. If you push the star formation rate density, it's way higher than we actually observed. So it was always a bit of a worry that we couldn't do it with galaxies. When Planck came down to a much smaller number last year, then uh, it looked much more comfortable. So the red line here is our best estimate from a paper by Brandt Robertson, basically using this star formation rate density. So as of last year, things looked quite comfortable. And then again, this year, um, Tau has come down again. And now, basically, we sit right in the middle of this. Okay, so things look very comfortable from one perspective. We've got plenty of galaxies to do the job. However, when looking at diagrams like this, it's always good to be aware of what assumptions go into these predictions. And we're assuming here the escape fraction is 20% at high redshift. Okay? So if you think that's a scarily high number, then it's maybe not that straightforward. So where are we with the Lyman continuum escape fraction? So I've maybe, maybe tongue in cheek, I've written, think of a number. And I'm pretty sure it's a number between 0 and 1. But other than that, I'm not sure about it at all. Now, there's been a lot of work going in observationally over the last 10 years ago trying to directly measure the Lyman continuum emission from galaxies at a redshift of about 3. From ground-based studies, you get lots of candidates where you think you can see Lyman continuum emission, but when you go for high-resolution HST imaging of these objects, you nearly always find that there's a lot of foreground contamination. You're not actually seeing Lyman continuum emission at all. Um, this is a, a typical example from a study this year from uh, uh, Grazia et al. in 2016. So this is about 40 Lyman break galaxies at a redshift of about three. They're imaging in the U-band, which is sitting on top of the Lyman continuum, and in the R-band, which is sitting on a rest wavelength of about 1,500 angstroms. In the, in the UV, and there's not much evidence here for a lot of Lyman continuum escaping from these ga galaxies on average. And the typical numbers you get from these experiments are something like 2 to 5%, nothing like the 20% that's assumed at high redshift. That's not to say that there aren't individual galaxies appearing in the literature which appear to show quite high escape fractions. So this is a particular example of taken from two papers by Eros van Zellen and Stefan de Barros over the last year or so. 
But there's a paper that was published by Alice Shapley a couple of months ago which shows very similar results for a different object. So here's this Redshift 3 Lyman Brake Galaxy, and we're observing it in the, basically the U band, the B band, and the V band. And this filter here should be sat on top of the Lyman continuum. And you can see that uh, there appears to be quite a lot of emission there. And when you take a very deep spectrum uh, with a VIMOS spectrograph on the VLT, you can see, at least on the smooth version, that we are detecting some Lyman continuum photons coming out of this object. And when you make plausible assumptions about what the intrinsic spectrum of th this object is, um, you come up with escape fractions as high as about 50%. But these are for individual objects. When you do this experiment for samples of objects, you find that the average number is pretty low, usually. So at this point, I was going to give a very brief summary of, of what simulations say the escape fraction is at high redshift. But I decided I couldn't, because my reading of the literature leaves me completely confused as to what, what the consensus is. And I think we'll maybe hear more about this later. But I've read studies that say it's quite high and studies that say it's very low. And I think we're still waiting for convergence at that point. From an observer's point of view, I think the bottom line is, is if it redshifts 6 and above, the escape fraction is something like 10%, things are fine. If it's as low as 1%, we're probably in trouble, I think. And we'll be looking for other sources of ionizing photons. There's been a lot of excitement recently about AGN again at high redshift. I have some slides at the end if people want to ask me about my opinion of that. but. Possibly we might have to go to AGN, though it doesn't look that likely at the moment. So what about going beyond photometry and trying to spectroscopically study these galaxies at high redshift? Well, it turns out to be incredibly difficult. And huge amounts of observing time have been spent on it. The first galaxies to be spectroscopically confirmed, you might say, were definitely in the epoch of ionization, came along in 2011. And there was four of them, all uh, reasonable detection of the Lyman alpha line. But they took integrations of sort of 10 hours on 8-meter telescopes to get a 5-sigma detection of the Lyman alpha line. Okay, So it's hard work to get even that. I think it's fair to say that progress over the last five years has been painfully slow. So five years ago, we had these four galaxies at redshift greater than 7. Currently, I think, we have 11 spectroscopically confirmed galaxies greater than redshift 7 that I believe, all of which are detected via Lyman alpha emission. Six of them have come with this new spectrograph on the Keck. So this is MOSFIRE, which is a multi-object spectrograph that works in the near-infrared and has kind of revolutionized this field, I think, thanks to its multiplex and high throughput. Um, and all five galaxies that we know of with spectroscopic redshifts greater than 7.5 have been discovered by MOSFIRE in the last two years, basically. So it's really coming along. What's made the difference also is people have been chasing galaxies at high redshift that are most likely to have strong nebular emission. Um, people have been looking at very bright galaxies in these candles fields, and they've been deliberately selecting objects from their SEDs, which appear to have very strong, typically oxygen, oxygen 3 emission, contaminating the long wavelength IRAC bands. So this is from a paper by Robert Sprasani from last year picked four incredibly bright objects at redshift kind of seven to eight and a half, all of which you can see have evidence for very strong oxygen-3 emission in the long IRAC band here. And then sure enough, when you follow them up with near-infrared spectrographs, you do get reasonable detections of the Lyman alpha emission line for these objects. So here's one uh, from Mimi Song's paper from this year uh, at a redshift of 7.7, signal-to-noise of about six-ish. And this is the Lyman alpha emission line here. Uh, and this is another one at Retch of 7.7 from a paper by Pascal Osh. And this is from the Roberts Bersani sample. And again, here's the Lyman alpha emission line. Okay? But these are long integrations just to get very low signal to noise confirmations that these things are actually at these redshifts. Given that Lyman alpha turns out to be so difficult uh, at Redshift greater than 7, uh, the latest state of the art is now to chase other strong UV emission lines in the near infrared and see if we can get other lines and learn something physical about these galaxies. Carbon-4, helium-2, oxygen-3, and carbon-3 being the, the main culprits. So here's a, here's a paper, uh, an object at redshift 6 from a paper by Dan Stark uh, last year. Here's a Lyman alpha emission line. Here you can see nothing, but when you smooth it, you can see carbon-3, okay? uh, which is exactly the right redshift to go with Lyman alpha. And you can see the, the, the negative dents that have been taken out uh, by the ABBA near-infrared spectroscopy pattern. 
Motivation here is to get another way to tell the redshifts of these objects, but also to learn something about the ionizing continuum of these guys, see what contribution they can make to the ionization, etc. Here's the latest one. This is really is low signal to noise. This is a redshift 7.7 .7 object with Lyman alpha, and then followed up at longer wavelengths, there's the carbon-3 doublet, okay? which on its own, you would never believe. But it has got another emission line at the same redshift. And it is starting to tell us, albeit some very ropey information, about what the ionizing continuum of these objects are. So a lot more of this work will be done over the next two or three years, I think, uh, prior to JWST becoming available. Now, I said at the start that I'd spend a few minutes talking about CR7. This is an object that's caused a lot of excitement in the literature um, for various reasons. It's actually discovered or sort of noted a bright Lyman break galaxy in one of Rebecca's first papers back in 2012. And this is her latest HST image of it. And you can see it's a triple component system with a very compact bright component down here and then two fainter components to the north. It was also selected by David Sobral in 2015 as a very bright narrowband object. So here's the posted stamps as a function of wavelength. And you can see this object is hugely bright in a narrow band sitting at 9,200 angstroms, which indicates very strong Lyman alpha emission. So he went along and took a spectrum at that wavelength regime and indeed got easily the best looking Lyman alpha line at high redshift that I've ever seen. Nice and high signal to noise and nice and asymmetric at redshift 6.6. That's not what's caused the excitement. The excitement is the spectrum he took in the J-band, which showed another emission line at 1640. So this is the claimed detection of, uh, of helium-2. This is kind of the holy grail of POP3 star formation, so everybody got very excited about that. And this is, to be fair, the best, the best signal-to-noise detection of helium-2 that I've seen at high redshift. When they published the paper, um, they did SED fitting to the photometry for this object. And you can see here we've got a big excess from helium-2, and we've got a blue color NIRAT band, and this is the photometry from the two nearby companions, B and C. And what they did was they fitted the composite data using standard POP2 old stellar populations for the two small components, and then the only way they could fit the emission lines in component A was to employ basically a zero metallicity POP3 model. Okay? Now, when people see helium-2, everybody says, oh, well, it's not POP3, it's an AGN. Right? That's the standard get-out for what it is. This object was a bit weird in that helium-2 was pretty narrow, and there wasn't really any evidence for carbon-3 in the spectrum. And you might have expected there to be carbon-3 if it was an AGN. So their explanation was that this was at least some evidence that there might be some POP3 star formation in this component A, and that is, this is not a complete list in any way of the papers that have been generated over the last year. Uh, as a result of that. Lots of them were centering on the POP3 explanation. Also, as we'll probably hear in the next talk, the alternative explanation of this is that it's the first evidence for a direct collapse black hole at high redshift, which would be equally exciting. So what we've been doing, um, key data to this is the near-infrared data and the long-wavelength IREC data. That's the data that holds the key to what's going on with this object. So over the last year, we've accessed, from the ongoing Ultra Vista survey, much deeper data in this regime and from a Spitzer survey called Splash, much deeper data in this regime as well. Okay, so to have another look at this object. And this is a paper that Rebecca will probably put on the archive next week or the week after. Here's the, here's the, uh, the main conclusion in this SED plot. So here's our updated photometry for this object. And the main component, component A, is shown in green. And two or three things have changed with the deeper data. The first of which is, the UV slope of this object is no longer ultra blue. It was ultra blue in the old data, it's no longer ultra blue. It's about minus two, which is kind of exactly standard for a normal star forming galaxy. As a result of the continuum being flatter, the equivalent width of the excess due to helium two has dropped by a factor of at least two. Helium two is clearly still there, but the strength of it compared to the continuum is much lower than previously claimed. And the other thing, which is key for POP3, is that this blue color, very strong contamination of the IRAP bands is exactly what we see uh, for O3 emission. Very strong oxygen emission at 5,007 angstroms. That's exactly what we see in normal Lyman alpha emitters at redshift 6. All of the ones that have been followed up successfully spectroscopically that I just talked about all have this very blue feature. Okay, so it's kind of exactly what we see for these object, other objects. And of course, if that really is oxygen 3, then it's probably not a POP3 stellar population. It's probably just a normal POP2 stellar population with a large amount of nebular emission 
Okay. Alternatively, it could also be a narrow line AGN. That's another viable explanation of the subject. Okay, the final thing I'll talk about briefly before finishing is ALMA at high redshift. Again, it's hard to come to a conclusion about what's going on. Um, but the promise of ALMA for revolutionizing this field is huge. A complete census of high redshift star formation, not just UV, but dust obscured as well. Information about the dust production, if there is any, at high redshift. And of course, because of its high spatial resolution, the, the ability to do, study gas dynamics as well. Okay, so everybody in the field is hugely uh, excited about the prospect of using ALMA to do these three things. The study that I'm going to talk about in a very biased way is one that came out about a month ago now, which is the deepest ALMA observations that have yet been taken, certainly in the continuum, and have been taken of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So here's the, here's the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, uh, with the last data coming in back in 2012. So this is the deepest ever near infrared image of the sky. It's about four and a half square up minutes, and it contains something like 4,000 galaxies in it, depending on how you count them. This is what it looks like in ALMA at 1.3 millimeters exactly the same area, and we have 16 galaxies, okay? But they dominate star formation at redshift 2 by a huge amount, okay? So this is at 1.3 millimeters. Here's the basic facts. It's 1.3 millimeter imaging. It was a 20-hour cycle uh, 1 plus 2 program that was rolled over. This was the largest allocation of all the cycle 1 and 2 ALMA programs. It's deliberately quite low spatial resolution to prevent us from resolving out flux for these objects. And it has an RMS of about 0.35 millijansky. So we have 16 sources uh, detected robustly in this map. And this is a sort of rogues gallery of the type of thing we see. There's a huge variety of morphologies. We have very compact red objects like this. This object here is actually a known X-ray AGN. We have classic sort of train wreck multi-component high redshift objects producing ALMA emission, and we all have classic star-forming disks at lower redshift as well. So that's the kind of thing that you see in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. The key take-home message is that if you want to know which galaxies are forming huge amounts of stars, then you better calculate their stellar mass and not look at their UV luminosity, because they're not very well matched. So because we're in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, we have incredible amounts of ancillary data, and we basically know most of the properties of these galaxies. So we can immediately plot stellar mass versus redshift for the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. The 16 red objects are the ones that are detected in ALMA. Okay, so at redshift, basically two to three, the mass of galaxies are all detected in ALMA as obscured star-forming galaxies. To be fair, seven out of nine galaxies with masses greater than a couple times 10 to 10 are highly obscured star-forming galaxies in ALMA. So you need to have the long-wave data to have any idea of what their total star formation rate is. And when you do calculate their total star formation rate, these ALMA sources are completely consistent with sitting on the main sequence of star formation. And this is the demonstration of that. This is star formation rate versus stellar mass. There's a huge literature in the, in the galaxy evolution observational community on the main sequence of star formation, but it's basically star formation going proportional to mass, give or take. And these ALMA sources, shown in red, actually fall on reasonable extrapolations of what the, uh, of what the main sequence of star formation is. However, you would not see that if you only looked at them in the UV. The light blue here shows their UV-based star formation rates. And the ratio of total to UV star formation rate for these objects is as large as 200. Okay, so all the star formation rate is obscured in these objects. But when you take that into account, then they sit exactly on the, on the main sequence of star formation rate that other people have determined previously. The highest mass ones have the highest ratio of total to UV. When you go down to masses of about 10 to 10, the ratio is about 50. When we get down to the lower mass objects, it drops down to about 5 or actually a lower ratio than that. So at high redshifts, where we're dominated by galaxies which have masses of about 10 to the 9 solar masses, basically calculating the UV and boosting it by about a factor of 5 gets you what the total star formation rate is. And that's what most people do anyway. So actually, previous estimates of what the star formation rate density of the universe is at redshifts greater than about 6 are probably pretty accurate. Okay? One more slide on ALMA. Um, although it's been very hard to get continuum dust emission detections, people have hard, tried very hard. There's been one or two continuum dust emission detections at, at high redshift, but not many. And these things have not apparently got a lot of dust in them. There does seem to be plenty of carbon. OK, so people have been looking at C2 at uh, 158 microns and had a lot more success 
uh, using that as a star formation tracer. So this is a particular example of a very luminous Lyman break galaxy at redshift 6, which has been confirmed with Lyman alpha spectroscopy. And here's the map from ALMA uh, in the C plus line. And you can see this one actually has got a very high signal to noise detection of the line in the, in the, in the ALMA data. And it's multi-component. So there's a couple of components in this object, which has given you some indication that you can tell something about the dynamics of these objects with very high signal to noise. Uh, ALMA data. And just very recently, there's actually also been a, a detection of uh, oxygen at a of 7, okay, at 88 microns. So there doesn't seem to be much dust in these objects, but there are metals. So it seems like the dust to metal ratio at high redshift is pretty low in these high redshift galaxies. So I'm more or less done. So in summary, then, I would say that on the basic demographics, the luminosity function, there's been great progress more to come with the frontier fields over the next year or so. There's been decent progress in the mass function, although we're fundamentally limited by the depth of Spitzer imaging currently. Escape fraction still seems completely up in the air to me. I can't see any sign of a consensus emerging in the literature, certainly not from the observations. People are now starting to have some success with near-infrared spectroscopy at redshifts greater than 7.5, thanks to chasing these strong nebular emission objects and thanks to the arrival of MOS fire although it's still incredibly hard work for what you get out of it, you might argue. We're still in the very early stages of ALMA, actually, but it seems to be already emerging that at redshift greater than 5, there's not a lot of dust that we can see at the moment, although there are metals, and there'll be much, much more to come over the next two or three years as ALMA ramps up to its full potential. The last thing I'd say would be about the promise of JWST. Um, deep, high-resolution imaging and spectroscopy in the rest frame optical and near infrared with these instruments in particular, but others as well, NURCA, NURSPEC, and MIRI, will completely revolutionize our understanding of the vast majority of these topics that I've just been discussing. Okay. Um, in terms of the stellar population ages, their masses, their metallicities, their nebular emission, and their ionizing output over this kind of redshift range, it will just completely blow us out of the water. So we're all just sitting around desperately hoping that it works straight out of the box. Finish there. Okay, questions for our speaker. What do I see? There's a hand gone up. Um, I just wanted to comment about uh, the statement uh, that you need 21st century escape fraction to produce the tau from Planck. And, and I just, just want to point out that this is very model dependent. And for example, uh, if you assume that the star formation is bursting instead of continuous, uh, you can actually get away with something like 4% instead of 20%, even assuming the same luminosity functions uh, that, you know, constrained by observations. Or, of course, if you, you know, add other sources like X-rays and, and stuff like that. Absolutely. I mean, if you're, if you're, gonna, if you're willing to add in other sources, then clearly there's, there's a lot more wiggle room. 20% um, is what's assumed in this red line here, which gets you to the middle here. Clearly, you can live with a lower escape fraction even with that model. So that there's a lot of slack. Um, but if the observations relentlessly come back with escape fractions of 1%, then you know, there may be an issue. But it's, just, it's a very hard measurement to make. Yeah. Other hands? Just a very short comment. There's also uncertainty in how many photons you get from the stellar population, the rotation. So if it's in a factor of two or three, they're always there. So Exactly. I've so I don't know about one, but 3% is the same as 10, for example. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Or 20, 20 can be actually five. Yeah. I completely glossed over that issue. There's the uncertainty with the escape fraction, but there's also the uncertainty of what the intrinsic ionizing spectrum of these objects are. And there's been, uh, there has been work on new stellar population models, including binaries recently which claim to be able to produce a factor of two or more ionizing photons, uh, if I can find it, this one here. So these, you may be aware of these bypass models by Elridge and Stanway, uh, which include binaries uh, rather than just single stars. And for a given, a given 1,500 angstrom luminosity they're producing here in black, something like a factor of two more ionizing photons. So there's all the slack in that direction as well. There's, yeah, John, I think it was. Hi, I had a question about the very faint end of the luminosity function mm. in the frontier field. So yep. 
especially with the magnification factors of 10 to 50, how much uncertainty is put in with the varying mass models of the cluster? Right. And, and especially, I'd like to hear your opinions of the, this wavelength uh, technique that Livermore and her collaborators are using. I don't know any more about it than having skim read that paper. So I'm not an expert on it. But there's two, as you're correct in saying, the frontier fields are a fantastic data set. Um, but there's two problems with them that make them difficult to work with, one of which is the, is, the, is the high magnifications and the uncertainty in the high magnifications. The other one, of course, is that you're looking behind this socking great cluster at lower edge, which has these huge galaxies in it, plus a lot of intercluster light that has to be subtracted off first before you can find these galaxies. So both of these things had to be done for this Livermore study, and, and anyone who wants to look at the, at the really faint end of the luminosity function will have to deal with both of these issues. Now, if you read this paper, they have done their best to factor in these uncertainties. Okay, so I don't want to be overly critical of what they've done, but I think this is not probably the final word on what the faint end slope is doing here. Okay, this is, first of all, they'll be doing more study. This is based on the first two out of six frontier field clusters, so there's more data out there. Um, but I think uh, more work is to be done here to fully quantify what the uncertainties are due to the lensing, et cetera. Well, I had a comment. So carbon and high redshift, A. No uh, 3D calculations, no non-LTE corrections, just carbon. There it is. Where do you think that goes? Uh, I think we probably, the honest answer to that, I think probably more of the same for the next two years until JWST comes along. Yeah. yeah. No, but I mean, uh, one of the ideas that's kicked around a lot these, in recent years is the notion that the carbon production might be early and then done mm -hmm. until the AGB stars. Yeah, so that's later that explains the lack so of that would be the. That would be the, the, the uh, consistency argument with uh, essentially chemically equivalent remnants in the CMP no stars. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. an excellent way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. excellent. Okay, great. I learned something. Okay, <laughs> so let's thank our speaker.